Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Microservices lessons learned from a startup perspective. So when we usually read and hear about success stories from, um, from microservices lessons learned, we usually hear about success stories from large industry players such as Netflix, Amazon, eBay, just to name a few. Just to name a few. And when you look at these success stories from a startup perspective, with far less resources and far less experience in this large scaling world, you might end up coming up with the idea, oh, that's fantastic, just let's copy that. But the problem is, what works in one organization is not working for every organization because the journey to microservices is different for every organization. And unfortunately, there exists no golden, easy rule that's easily applicable. One of the reasons why every journey is different is because every organization is facing totally different circumstances. So, um, for example, uh, the team, its structure, skill set, and also its size has a huge impact on what is manageable for you, especially in the beginning. And if you are a small team with less DevOps practices in place, it has a huge impact on your, t um, on your transformation progress velocity. And you still have your legacy system that requires a lot of maintenance ever effort, which reduces the available time that, uh, that, can you, that you can use for your transformation process. And if you are run, and also your runtime environment is impacting your journey. For example, if you are running on-prem or if you're running on cloud native, has a um, huge impact since are you getting all services managed or do you have to set up everything from scratch and manage it by yourself? And if your strategy is to implement um, as new features in a short period of time, you might struggle with the decision where to implement it. Shall I use it, uh, shall I implement it as a new service or do I add it to the monolith and feeding the monolith? So to give you a little background, my name is Susanne, my name is Susanne Kaiser. I am from Hamburg, Germany, and I used to be the CTO of a startup. Um, uh, just software. This startup was um, is developing a, a solution that's called Just Social. It's a digital workplace for communicating and collaborating in teams. And to give you a little background, uh, we have to go a little bit uh, to the to the beginning. So everything. Um, in the beginning, was every, every aspect was a monolith in every aspect. So we had one team working on one collaboration product and um, developed as one code base based on one technology stack. And after time, everything was evolving. evolving. So our team got bigger and bigger. We added more and more features to our, to, uh, to our software solution. And then also um, the code base got bigger and bigger and the number of, of users increased. So that's supposed to be very great, but um, after a while, everything felt kind of clunky, very tight together. So um, our, since our team was growing, um, the, the meetings and discussions and decisions took longer than before. And um, there were now clearly assigned responsibilities. So it took a while someone felt responsible, for example, when a bug occurred, who's taking care of it. So the processes were slowing down and our productivity suffered. And due to the fact that we added more and more features to our solution, to our product, um, the usability and user, uh, user experience suffered through the continuous feature amendments. And instead of solving our users' problems very easily, we were increasingly confusing, confusing them. And also, it was quite difficult to add new features without impacting the entire, uh, the entire solution, and quite complex to release a new change without rebuilding the entire monolith, which then uh, led to um, um, higher risk deployment, which happened less frequently, so new, new features released slowly. So there was a need to split and shift things, and more than three years ago, we um, we had a change in our product strategy and foc we were focusing on improving uh, the usability and user experience improve, um, with its usability and user experience improvements and we were splitting our one collaboration uh, product into separate collaboration apps and each of them is taking care of specific use case. For example, 
Um, one app for managing documents, one app for communicating in real time, for sharing corporate news, and also for um, yeah, managing your tasks with, um, within your teams. And in addition to that, our, we split our one team into multiple teams and assigned to each of them um, a specific set of, of uh, collaboration apps so that each team has a clearly assigned responsibility to have, in the long run, autonomous cross-functional teams that can work at different parts of the system independently. So as the next consequent uh, was a logical step uh, was to reflect this autonomy also in our software architecture by introducing microservices. <coughs> because the motivation for us, for microservices, it's pretty much the same, I guess, for everyone, but we wanted to have autonomous teams working at different parts of our uh, solution independently with minimal impact across the teams and develop them independently, but also deploy them independently, and also have the possibility to scale them independently and at a different speed. So every team could develop and deploy their collaboration apps as a at a different speed than another team. So how to start now the journey to microservices? And it comes always as first identifying good candidates for microservices. Um, Good candidates for microservices follow some key concepts, and the co key concept is um, high cohesion within the service and loose coupling between the services. In domain-driven design, high cohesion is usually reflected by related behavior that shall stay consistent and that change, uh, change together. And um, so a bounded context itself, that's a, it's a semantic boundary around your, your uh, domain model uh, where your domain model lives in, and uh, describes, uh, describes services um, that are responsible for well-defined business functions. In our case, we used our collaboration apps as high-level bounded contexts that, that are reflecting coarse-grained service boundaries. And our journey started with the collaboration app Just Drive that's taking care of managing and sharing documents. Each document is created by an author. The author data is, is stemming from profile data, which is still hold, uh, which is, is, is a bounded context, just people of, um, um, which is um, hold by a different bounded context, just people taking care of profile management. And so with the first candidate, Just Drive This Collaboration app, um, we built it as a coexisting solution from scratch. And what, what we have to consider in this, uh, this case is that it was not an exact equivalent of the existing one, but instead we, are, it's, we added also a lot of new features, we modified the user interface, and we made significant code changes, uh, uh, changes to the data structure itself. Um, but with a new, with a new service that we um, uh, built as a co coexisting service, um, it's that the um, bounded context now consists of its domain model, which is um, reflecting the business logic, and the application service uh, orchestrating use cases and also um, manages transaction, and its input and output adapters like REST APIs and on also um, um, persistent management. And this coexisting service itself owns the document states exclusively. That means that's the only one that can write and read the document data. Um, as I mentioned before, each document is created by an author, and the author data or the author data is stemming from the profile state uh, from the profile data, which is still handled by the monolith. And to avoid that we are requesting um, the author-related data from the monolith each time we are displaying a document, we kept a local copy of the author data, which is an extract of the profile data, in our new service. And to keep the state of this local copy in sync with the original data, we had to get notified by our monolith that a profile has been updated. So we were communicating event-driven. So whenever a profile has been changed on the monolith, it publishes a profile updated event to the message broker that the new server is subscribed to. 
And whenever this happens, whenever this event occurs, it updates its replicate accordingly. Um, in hindsight, um, there's nothing wrong with um, starting with a coexisting service from scratch, but in our case, it was quite, quite complex because, uh, as I mentioned before, we did not only um, extracted or built a service from scratch, but we also interweaved a lot of complexities into that one. We added new features, uh, we modified the, uh, the user interface and made significant code uh, changes to the data structure. So there were too many steps at once, especially uh, which, which threw us, um, uh, which slowed, slowed down the process itself. And we were retrieving very, very late results with the first candidate. With what, which was not really a very good optimal start because, especially in the beginning, it's very critical that you get fast results to gain experience very early on so that you can feel confident with microservices and also with the extraction process. So, with the next candidate, um, we followed a different approach. Um, we followed the um, decomposition approach of top-down. And um, so we were first extracting the user interface um, as a separate web app and provided an REST API uh, on the monolith that the new extracted user interface could address. At that point, uh, we could uh, iterate on, on the user interface very rapidly. So we used, as the next candidate, the chat app um, for communicating in real time. And with the next step, we extracted then the business logic from the monolith to, to, the, new, to the new bounded concept, to the new service, and that resulted in significant code changes on the monolith itself. And um, at this moment, sometimes it might be necessary that uh, in case of the monolith, it depends on the dependencies, in ca um, that the monolith requires some additional data so that the monolith is also addressing the REST API for some chat logic related uh, concerns. At that time, we're still sharing the same um, data storage, but to become a standalone autonomous service, it has to, um, to manage its state exclu exclusively. So at that time, we are splitting the storage service as well. And um, for each uh, chat communication, chat participants are involved. And um, so it's, we, have to, we are keeping a local copy of the chat participants as well, which resides, uh, um, which is still owned by the monolith. And to keep the chat participant data in sync, we subscribe to the profile updated event that I, that I described earlier on in the other example. So, and when you have multiple um, services, it's also sometimes really a struggle how to prioritize which one should I use, should I start with. And I would recommend um, to start with those ones that are easy to extract and uh, where you can gain fast results and gain early experience with microservices. And, um, and also you can, the next priority option that you have is um, to to ask yourself what is the greatest benefits after you have extracted the service. For example, if you have a service that is changing very frequently, uh, you can use this as a good candidate to extract uh, because that one is then um, it's able to deploy and release it, uh, to develop and release it um, independently from the others and to release these changes very quickly. Another thing, another option or another consideration is for your prioritization is um, if you have services that require different resources, um, for example, um, if it's required different CPU or uh, memory resources, after you have extracted the service, you can then deploy it on an instance with um, more memory, for example. So we had one example, we had a service that is um, generating previews or documents and required a more CPU than other services. And after we have extracted it, we could deploy it on a, di on a separate instance with higher CPU power. And with every service that we extracted, we got confronted with the question how to handle authorization. And the thing is that in our case, the authorization is very fine-grained down to domain object level. So that means that every collaboration app 
is, uh, um, is, is managing uh, what the user can see, for example, you in the Drive uh, document service, uh, you can adjust the authorization setting if you can uh, read or update a document that um, that's depending on the settings on the authorization setting of its parent folder where she resides in. So, and on the other hand, is that the um, we also have to reflect the inter-service dependency. For example, um, that you that one service, for example, is meant is and residing on a different bounded context is having an impact on the authorization level of a, of a domain object residing in another bounded context. For example, if you attach a document to a content page, the authorization settings are related to, um, um, are set in the, in the content page app, but uh, it's residing in a different bounded context than the document. So the, the problem is it was quite complex and we, we uh, delayed the handling, the distributed handling, uh, the handling of distributed authorization, and what happened as a co as a consequence was very counterproductive because since we didn't have also um, distributed authorization handling, was that um, at from the very beginning was that we when we ever whenever we wanted to introduce a new service, uh, we had we had to make this decision where to, how to to solve authorization handling. So, and since in some cases, we were thinking, okay, let's put the service where authorization was already uh, handled from the very beginning, and that was the monolith. So we were feeding the monolith on the one side, and, and on the other side is, okay, I have a new service, then I, re I, re I implement the authorization handling in my service itself, which happened then that you were re-implementing a cross-content concern in this case with every service. And if we have, would have solved this problem from very early on, it could have saved us from, from the pitfalls. So handle cross-cutting concerns is very, uh, handle cross-cutting concerns early on is very critical to avoid feeding the monoliths and avoid uh, re-implementing authorization with every new service. But if you, to make a short, long story short, we uh, centralized the authorization handling to one centralized service in the, in the end. But if you introduce a centralized service, there another risk comes with it. It's the risk of a distributed monolith. So if you have, uh, if you need to change, you if you change the service on one side and you have to, to change another service at the other side at the same time and to deploy it into together, it's a strong indicator that you have introduced a, a distributed monolith. So, and if that's the case, then you are, um, combining the disadvantages of both worlds, you're still coupled, but now have, you have to communicate over a slow and unreliable network. So to avoid the risk of introducing a dis uh, distributed model is, is um, for centralized services to provide um, a common contract that the centralized service owns and every downstream service has to conform to. For example, um, if a service needs authorization-related uh, actions or um, uh, requests, it translates this one into the common contract that the centralized authorization service um, understands without extra extra translation. And there's also so that means, for example, if you now now e add a new service, a new microservice, a new collaboration app, is that you uh, that this new um, microservice itself is translating the authorization related actions into this common contract, but you don't have to touch the centralized authorization service, and that's very important. You can add new, can add a new service without adjusting and redeploying the centralized service. And one prerequisite is that this common contract is stable, because if you change it a lot, then you shift the problem to the other side, then you have to adjust all the other services at its um, all, um, uh, a lot of times. So, um, with microservices, we also have to consider how your services shall interact with each other. And um, so, there are different approaches. We have the request-driven request -driven service interaction, where the services are communicating with each other directly over their API. Um, that allows the calling service to uh, the control um, of the of the request flow itself. 
but you in, in, uh, introduce um, higher coupling between those services because what happens when the other service that received this request is not is responding very slowly or is, is, is not even available. And another option for service interaction is the event-driven service interaction where your services are not communicating with each other directly, but instead they are communicating over events um, by a message broker. So whenever something happens in, in one service, it publishes an event to the message broker and can be consumed um, by the subscribing services at their own pace and independently from, this, uh, from the events that have been published to the message broker. So when, when a service is now down, it doesn't have an impact on the service that publishes the event. In a hybrid model, you are combining command and query, the request-driven and the uh, event-driven um, service interaction. I'll give an example later. Um, one downside about um, the event-driven service interaction is that you introduce a new component, and that's the message broker. So it has to be to set up, manage, monitor as well. So um, another question that comes, comes up with, with, um, with microservices is how to manage the shared state. And in a hybrid model where you have combined request-driven and uh, event-driven uh, interaction, um, there is that you have, for example, that, that the one service is notifying your uh, other services that something happened, but, to, but other services are uh, requesting additional data from, from the source itself by doing remote cross-context query directly to the source. And in this case, the problem is that you still have a kind of coupling aspect in here because you, have to do, so you still have to do the remote query um, cross-contact query to the source itself. Another way is um, not to use events only for notification purposes, as, as, as I've described before, but also for now only for, um, for event-driven state transfer. So in this case, for example, as I've described in the pre previous examples, is um, one scenario is that you keep a local copy of, of shared data in your own service and to get updated or to, to, to sync those both data from the, the co local copy with the original data, you are subscribing to a message broker to, keep, to get updated as soon as this um, data has been, uh, been updated and published as an event to the message broker. So in this case, you are using events not only for, for notification, but also for, for, for data duplication. Another aspect that you have to consider is the source of truth, because in traditional event-driven systems, you usually have, um, you save your actions in a database and you publish events to a message broker um, to notify other services. The thing is that with this, with this approach is that um, the source of truth for your service itself, it's your database. But for all other downstream services, the events are the source of truth. So we have two sources of truth. And you have, you have to manage dual rights, um, saving actions to the database, but also publishing this event that has to stay consistent. So you have to manage the consistency between these two actions. And another issue is that the data model of the data in the database can diverge very easily from the data model of the events in the message broker. And one approach is uh, to merge these two uh, by retaining events long term, to make events as first class citizen, and so that your service itself is using the events as a source of truth, but also all downstream services as well. And here comes Kafka into place. Uh, I guess you have been to the previous talk as well, so it's um, repeating myself a little bit, but Kafka is uh, well known for keeping uh, events long, long term. And they combine the capabilities of um, a messaging system, a storage system, and a streaming platform. When we started with microservices, um, we had Apache Kafka introduced from very early on, but we used it in at the very beginning, only for, uh, for notification purposes. Then we used events for event-driven state transfer. 
And lately, we also started to introduce Kafka Streams as well. So um, a stream itself, it's an um, unbounded uh, ordered sequence of data records that are um, consisting just of key value pay, uh, pairs. And these, these streams are continuously updating. And in Kafka Streams, it's possible to um, load a topic into your stream um, that can be processed in the, uh, in the code base of your service, in the same process of your microservice. So a Kafka topic is a logical category of your, um, of your events, for example, um, profile updated event, profile topic for profile updated events, or a document topic for, for document related events. And um, it stores the stream um, uh, in a lightweight embedded state store and uh, it backs it up. Um, and you can also create your own state store, coming to this point a little bit later. And the, the, the thing is that the stream itself is running on the same process as your microservice. It's not running on the Kafka broker. It's, it's, it's running on the same process. So s Kafka streams make the data available wherever you need it. It's pushed to your service itself. And it's, um, it's, it's uh, uh, providing Kafka Stream is providing an API, um, a DSL for for um, joining, filtering, uh, grouping, and aggregating your streams, and also provides a function like operators on each data record in your streams, like map, reduce, uh, and and uh, and so on, and transform, and so on. And what's also um, relevant is when you implement stream processing you usually need to you need to have a stream but also a database for data enrichment and kafka streams themselves they they combine these two by the capabilities of the characteristics of its stream table duality so um, a stream itself can can be viewed as change log of state changes which cap captures um, the state changes of a table and the table itself can be considered as a snapshot of the latest value for each key in the stream. And how did we use this? So um, we started to use it for materialized views. Um, and the thing is that what, what we can do now is, for example, if you remember, we kept a local copy um, when we were communicating, like um, the document service itself uh, was keeping a local copy that has to be kept in sync with the original data by subscribing to a profile updated event and, and consuming this event and update the replicate accordingly. With Kafka Streams itself, uh, it's, it's making this one um, obsolete to keep a local copy. So, but to, to give you an example how it could work, so there is, for example, um, the service itself, the document service can now um, create a stream out of the document topic, which keeps, which is relevant for the document events, and can also create a table for enrichment from the profile topic for the author data. And combine it, can join it, um, and, and store its, its result of the join between the stream and the table into a, a state store that you create. And this state store itself can be accessed by, for example, a REST API to be used as an inbuilt materialized view. For example, if you display documents along with author data, you, all you have to do is to combine these two to create a stream, to create a table, join them states in the state store and address them, for, for example, for, with an a, a REST API. So whenever something happens or something changed, either your document or your profile data, this inbuilt materialized view gets updated uh, on the fly without your, your responsibility to update it by yourself. In comparison to, um, to the other event-driven aspects, events for notification, events for data duplication, um, event streams itself allows you to eliminate um, the the local copy, which reduces then the duplicating effort that I have described previously. Because you don't have to keep this local copy in your service anymore. You can just access the stream, which run in the same process as your microservice. 
And since you don't have to do request to the uh, uh, broker, you can, um, because then your, your, your Kafka streams are pushed to, to your service where it's needed, and you just have to create a stream, and um, that means that you don't have to address uh, um, another component, the broker, anymore. So this increases pluggability. For example, you can now say, okay, if all your so, uh, prerequisite, for example, the data that you would like to work with are all kept as events in the message broker, can then you as a new service can create a stream of all the topics that are relevant for you, and um, you can add a new service without uh, creating its own data storage and keeping a local copy of the shared data. And just the only have to do is to, to create a new steam, stream and join it with other streams or tables. So there is a lower barrier to entry for, for new services and increases the pluggability. But also you have to take into the consideration um, that not only like um, the service interaction and, and um, how to share the data is relevant for your microservices ecosystem, but uh, I guess a lot of the burden is to is the infrastructure complexities that goes along with introducing microservices. And I'm not going into the detail of it, everyone because I have already mentioned it in the keynote. But it's a lot. It's a lot of things to do, and it's, it's, a, it's a really high burden if you have to do all them by yourself. All, all by them. By all them by yourself and manage them all by yourself. So this shifts the focus um, from 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 delivering business value to handling a lot of infrastructure complexities. And but the problem is that it's very important that you focus on 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 your on your business value itself. So that you focus on on your uh, business domain itself, or rather on your core domain, which differentiates you from your competitors. Since your core domain or your business domain in general is the one that generates the visible business value to, to your users. And if you focus um, on your core domain again, it's, um, it's generating visible business value, leading to higher customer satisfaction. So, and there is also another approach is, um, yeah, to um, to focus or to strategically invest into those parts of your of your solution, which uh, is yeah differentiating, dis um, um, distinguishing you from your competitors in the market, and this um, to so you should strategically invest in the differentiating parts of your of your solution, and offload those undifferentiating heavy liftings that comes with all the infrastructure complexity if, if you try to to um, to handle them all by yourself and if you can offload all these undifferentiating heavy lifting it lo allows you to increase the software delivery performance and uh, to, de to deliver your business um, value faster and Increasing the software delivery performance has a huge impact on your profitability and productivity and also your market share. So the thing is, that what I would do, like um, more focusing also more on um, separating the concerns in terms of responsibilities and try to use the total cost of ownerships in terms of that I'm shifting all the infrastructure complexities or most of them to someone else who takes care of it by Offloading the common building blocks of your of your infrastructure, that can getting that managed by for, by by cloud providers, that they are to going to take care of it. So, just as a summary, summary, um, what we have learned during our journey, it's a still ongoing journey. I guess it kind of never ends. And the thing is that um, it's, I would say that's. Um, critical to start small, otherwise you are not getting early results and can, cannot gain uh, um, early experience with microservices. So start with, with small candidates that you can easily extract. And also um, to, to uh, um, avoid feeding the monolith or re-implementing a cross-cutting concern on every service level, handle the cross-cutting concerns early on. That's very critical. That's um, not and run, don't run into this counter uh, uh, productive consequences that we had. 
And when you provide centralized service, it's very relevant that you um, that you uh, provide a common contract and avoid a to, to avoid a distributed monolith. Um, so in our case, that we provide a common contract with the, for the centralized authorization service. And since your services or your, your um, software architecture has to be um, de designed to be to be easy to evolve and uh, to be changed over the time very easily, consider uh, design your system event driven and also consider as well uh, event stream for for um, for your for your data uh, publication in your in your propagation in your in your service ecosystem, and also like as I said um, um, that was the last slide slide is consider managed services to offload you all your infrastructure or uh, the majority of your infrastructure complexities to to pu public cloud providers, and be aware that um, also of your affecting circumstances like. Um, like try to f find out or to figure out which 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 aspects or which um, circumstances are blocking you, what is, which are slowing you down, and try to adjust it if it's possible. And to also, it's very important, very critical to have the whole management team on your side. Otherwise, that's the blocking factor, by the way. And yeah, be aware. Every every journey is different, so our journey is totally different than yours, and that's totally okay. Thank you. We have some minutes left for some questions. Do you have some, some questions? No? Okay. Then, thanks again. Thanks. <laughs>